ridiculous fondling cardboard. What is up? Welcome back to Fondling Cardboard. I'm your host, Mike Lacusta, aka the Golf Card Collector. And in the words of Jesse Rhodes Gibson, we've got a goulash episode for you guys today. And honestly, I'm really excited about it. I know I say that every episode. I got good stuff for you, blah, blah, blah. I'm sure that's how people are supposed to start a podcast. But I honestly don't know how I managed to fit in so many different topics all into one episode. So I hope you guys enjoy it. And just to pique your interest, I'll do a quick rundown of the topics for today. We're going to do a check-in uh, with a friend of the show, James Peacock. We are going to get an update on the 1927 Bobby Jones card that was seized during shipping. We've got some golf card talk from the Stacking Slabs podcast. I just had to play it because they dive into some Scotty Scheffler talk. We've got Card of the Week, which I missed last week, so we're going to cover last week's and this week's, which comes with a pretty cool story. I'm going to be answering a few mailbag questions that have been patiently waiting, and we're going to end with a recipe to be successful in the hobby. So if that all sounds intriguing to you guys, you're in the right place. So we're going to start off with this interview with James Peacock. We rehashed how we each got into the trading card hobby, how to make the most of the golf card and memorabilia Facebook group, and some reflections on collecting versus investing. Here we go. Hey, James. Thanks for joining Fondling Cardboard. What is up? How you doing? Doing awesome, man. This is a long time coming. Thanks for having me on. You bet. You bet. So for the benefit of our listeners, um, could you give... Just a brief bio of yourself as a collector. Yeah, no problem. Um, I've started back collecting back in like 99 in, in the Pokemon craze. Uh, I got sucked into the video games and then I started going to school and seeing everyone at lunch flipping binders and I just, I had to jump in. So did that for a few years. Um, and that's really what got me into collecting as a whole. And then I took a break from it for a, for a while. Um, I kind of just grew up and kind of forgot about Pokemon for a while. And then I got back into Pokemon when one of the anniversary sets came out in 2016. Uh, so I kind of got back into it there and I was into it all the way through COVID and then the prices just started to get insane. So to kind of supplement that, um, you know, I got into, I got into golf cards and um, I initially found golf cards in the 2019 Masters. So once Tiger won, I went on eBay and I found that they did have cards and that was like my first entry point to it. And I noticed how cheap everything was and I can rip a ton of packs and I kind of just went nuts and have been really hooked to, to golf cards since then. Awesome. You know, I think, I think a lot of us can relate to what you just described. I started collecting cards when Pokemon fad came out and uh, that put me down a long line of different TCGs that I would play and collect. Um, and similar time frame too, 2019 masters. I mean, I wasn't, I didn't quite start then collecting cards, but what that had inspired me to do was um, to to try and find like a 2019 Masters flag. And I was I was looking for one that was autographed by Tiger Woods. I didn't end up finding one at that time, but within about a year of that um, kind of searching, I can't, I stumbled across golf carts, and that that's kind of what I how I ended up getting into it as well. Wow, so, so very similar because I actually that day the only thing I did end up buying on eBay that night was a twenty unsigned twenty nineteen Masters flag which I have hanging in my office. But uh, I think just in those search results because I think I just did like vague searches. Um, some of like the you know the ninety seven and ninety eight like Masters collection cards were coming up, so I was like those vertical ones with like the gold trim, and I was like those were I think were like the first cards I'd ever seen, and it just a light bulb went off that I was like oh my god how did I not even know that they exist? So I think part of that's a marketing problem on on their end, and then part of it was me just not being hungry enough for golf collectibles yet until you know the big tiger win. You know what's funny is actually twenty nineteen kind of time frame, I actually was aware of sports cards and golf cards a little bit because I wanted to buy a new truck and I was trying to save up some money. And I was just kind of looking through my closet saying, you know, I, I had a lot of junk that I could sell um, on, on Facebook marketplace and that sort of thing. And I came across my old cards and I, I remember looking at them 
and I actually did pull out some Pokemon cards and, and sold some because I knew you could easily make a few hundred dollars to add to the truck fund. And I looked at my box of basketball cards and I told myself, no, you're not, you're not allowed to start parting out your sports cards because for some reason those had a special place in my heart gotcha. and, and the time frame of when I was collecting those. Um, that 2019 win, it, I think that will hold a special place in all of us, in all of the golf fans' hearts. I'm sure we can all remember exactly where we were, where you were sitting, who you were with, the ambiance around you as you watched, I mean, for the most part on TV, uh, Tiger, you know, walking off the green, hugging Charlie. It uh, It's a pretty special moment. For me, I was actually with my grandfather, who's not with us anymore, yeah. and him sitting next to me in a rocking chair. That was just such a such a special moment for me. Yeah, that is such a special moment. I uh, was just in an apartment and my wife in the background had no interest in what I was doing or caring about. She was looking at me like I was crazy, but uh, I was hyped. And yeah, I know I know I could see myself what I'm wearing, what I'm doing. And uh, yeah, man, that's what that's what kicked it all off. And and that was it really golf cards and Pokemon cards, really all that I've been into. So I'm kind of one of those evergreen ones that you know, haven't been exposed to a lot of the other sets and a lot of the other iconic sort of cards in the hobby. Um, I do actually have a big like football and baseball collection, but it's from my parents. That was back when they invested in a bunch of cards in the in the wax days. So I have a tons of sets. I don't know what they mean. I just know when I looked them up once, they were just the stuff that was printed to the moon. Mm. And uh, outside of that, I don't really have any exposure into like out, any other sports. Yeah, so that, that would be called the junk wax era where they're yes. just printed to the moon. <laughs> Um, so the, we are connected originally through the golf cards and memorabilia Facebook group, and you're one of our top group contributors. Um, you know, what advice do you have, uh, for listeners to get the most out of that group? Yeah, um, definitely join if you're not. And then once you're in, I would say, you know, I would love to see people asking a lot more just questions, right? There are no dumb questions. And I, I even asked you about prisms and, and some of those other things that I had no clue about. And th that could be seen as a really dumb question because like, if, you know, if you've collected anything other than what I collect, those questions are very obvious. So I think it's it's really easy to think something's like silly to ask. So don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, even if I don't know the answer, I love looking it up and going down the rabbit holes of learning new things myself. So don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to just post your mail days. Like I started my first couple of posts ever, but just like mail day posts, like showing off my favorite stuff that I won that week. Um, yeah. And then just be active, like in the threads that you post, you even prompt things every week now, sort of like, what are your wins, big or small, just, just be active. And I think like, if you're having fun with the hobby and, and you're enjoying golf cards, like there isn't a better place to be for, for like-minded people. So just, just be active and say hello, introduce yourself. And, you know, that's how I met a few people on here that, um, I was just, we were talking a little bit before we started recording and I don't have a huge social circle, but I would say a big percentage of my social circle are friends I found either through that group or, or groups like that. That's amazing. You know, I, I agree. We're a pretty close knit group in the golf card community, but, uh, 100% open to any listeners who want to join us. Um, for us moderators and administrators of the group, um, as you mentioned, I'm starting to prompt weekly, you know, what are some of your wins, um, uh, you know, uh, who have you done some transactions lately? So we can kind of boost each other that way. Uh, mailbag for the funneling cardboard podcast. Uh, is there anything else that you can think of to kind of make uh, the group a bit better uh, from, you know, for us moderators to improve on? No, I don't, I don't think from a moderation perspective, I think that's all pretty good. Um, maybe when, you know, people are selling like 10 different items, maybe they can like thread it under one post or something. That's like the only thing that's maybe popped up. Um, but even then we don't even get that much like daily activity to where it, it's cumbersome. But I think if we do grow and get a lot more active with like selling, maybe that's like one area, but other than that, it's just more content. I just, I, 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 pro I could probably post more myself. Um, so no, nothing from a moderation perspective, I would think outside of maybe consolidating the, the threads when people are selling a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. And in terms of content, obviously there's a lot of buying and selling going on. Um, some of those people are investors, let's call them, who who just want to buy a card for cheap and, and flip it. Some of them are like us, who are very passionate about golf cards. H how would you kind of describe that community landscape of like collectors versus investors? Yeah, I mean, I think honestly, going back to our series on this podcast, if you guys didn't hear it, um, definitely go back and listen. 
Um, but I think that thought exercise really opened up my mind to a few things. I think I was a little bit close-minded to it. And, and looking back, I think it was because I can actually see myself going down that rabbit hole. Um, meaning like I can see how it's tempting to want to like use that as a way to like grow your wealth. I can, I can see the appeal of wanting to have that be sort of your, your job, your full-time job or something. But anytime, like I used to like love a game called the world of Warcraft. And one of my favorite parts of that game was like just using the auction house and buying and selling items and flipping it and trying to make money. And, and I think the more I took that seriously, the less like fun I had. And there was like a correlation there. So I just, I think golf cards, I just hold so close for me as like a fun personal hobby that I think any sort of negativity I have towards that group of people is just because it's like my own projecting of like, I don't want to fall down that rabbit hole and I don't want myself to lose the enjoyment that I have with collecting golf cards. So I, I definitely don't have anything against it. And I think a lot of the pros I said on the previous episodes of like, the more people that are involved, the better, the more chances of you have to like sell an item or find an item or the more people are ripping packs, the more I can complete my sets. And there are a lot of pros to it. Um, and I can just deal with some of the cons. Like it, I can get over myself in terms of some of that stuff. A lot of it, I think was just, some like you know self reflection kind of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but in terms of like describing the the landscape, I think it's actually a good balance. I think for golf, it seems like the, the majority of people are collectors because like if you're a straight investor, I don't think the, the first place you're going to be is golf cards. I think there are ten things before golf cards that you're probably going to spend your time on. Um, who knows as it grows, who knows what'll happen with Panini and, and all that stuff. Um, who knows how long we're going to keep getting upper deck cards for. I, um, so like, there's a lot of unknowns, but like, I'm, I definitely think the dynamic is actually pretty healthy. I think the majority of people are collectors and then the people that are in the investors aren't like doing anything to make huge swings or make my life difficult in any way. It's just, you know, sometimes I don't get a response because they don't even realize they have a card that I'm looking for. But I think that's all issues that collectors deal with in all the sports. So I actually think we have a good balance of like collector versus investor where it tips more on the side of the collector. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of in, ins and outs in that debate, collecting versus investing. Uh, you put it really well to me in a private conversation. Uh, I hope it's okay if I share this, but you said, uh, it was with regards to the New Year's resolutions that the Sports Card Strategy Show had published from some of their listeners, and I aired uh, several of those on a Funneling Cardboard episode, and the feedback you gave me was, it was almost like listening to like a work meeting, right? And this this is a hobby, and, and we're here to exactly. have fun. We're here to appreciate the cards, and to hear people drone on and on about profit and uh, selling markers and all this stuff, it's like, you know, where where's, I mean... Sure, there can be some fun, I guess, in that, but it, where, where's sort of the past time? Because this is supposed to be something you just escape from your real world into. And if all you're doing is trying to make money, then it's it's like you're back on the grind. So here's the story of my 1927 Churchman's Cigarettes R.T. Bobby Jones PSA 2 Small Famous Golfer's Tobacco Card. So I bought this card months ago thinking that I was buying his rookie card. And when I say rookie card, I mean the 1926 Churchman's card. Or is it Churchman's? Lambert and Sons, whatever. The 1926 Bobby Jones card. And it has the exact same image. It's just that the border and so there's some slight differences. So if you're paying attention, or if I even just looked at the number, 1927 versus 26, I would have realized I was not getting the steal of a deal that I thought I was. Um, however, you know, I still got a decent price on the card. I checked with our community vintage pre-war golf card expert, John Morton. He he validated my purchase and said, no, you, you got a good price even for that card. So I was happy with it. But something was kind of eating away at me. Um, and after a couple months of owning this card, it just didn't sit right with me. Like I wanted his rookie card. I thought I was getting a steal of a deal. At the end of the day, the money didn't really matter. I was just staring at this card knowing that it's not his rookie. And it's still almost a 100-year-old card, this beautiful piece of history, uh, in a PSA 2 slab. Uh, however, like, awesome condition. Like, PSA 1s and 2s can have a vast variance in condition. They can be pretty ratted up, they can be ugly, but still deserving of that grade uh, of a 2 if you know they're not creased in half or whatever whereas this one i think it did have a little crease somewhere on the card but honestly you couldn't see it but other than that the card looked great so i thought you know what 
someone else would really admire this card, really enjoy this card, and I decided to sell it. I guess that was mistake number one. So I listed on eBay, accepted a best offer, and it was to a purchaser in the US. So I shipped it out, um, and I used eBay's uh, shipping label, which by the way, I 100% recommend. eBay gets crazy good discounted rates, especially for Canadians. Like I'm talking 60, 70% off of regular postage. So for those of you who are spending 20, $24 Canadian to ship something to the US, you can you can literally ship it for like $8 Canadian. So do that. However, when you're doing it, uh, there's a customs form that you have to fill out through the eBay app. And as you're doing it, it just automatically populates the description of the contents. And in this case, it says 1927, Churchman's Cigarettes, RT, Bobby Jones, blah, 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 blah. And so normally what I actually do, just because I don't want to cause confusion, I normally just erase that and I just write one sports trading card or one golf trading card, something along those lines. In this case, I had just sold a handful of cards and I was kind of in a rush printing a bunch of labels. And I just said, ah, whatever. I, I, I didn't delete it. I just accepted the description as it was. Shipped out the card and eBay is, is great actually with payouts. So within a few days, um, cause it had my tracking information. It knew that I got the label from them. It saw that it was scanned. So I got paid, uh, whatever it was, a few hundred dollars. And a month later I get a, 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 a what is it? Reimbursement request or whatever, like a refund request from the buyer. And he said, Hey, I haven't received the card. I don't see it updating. Uh, could you, send me a refund and i responded just saying hey could you mind giving me a week just let me look into it so i'm so call canada post and they just say sorry it just seems like it's on pause we'll open a claim and we'll get back to you within 30 days i'm like ah oh, geez 30 days uh this guy i, I only promised the guy a week like, 30 days isn't going to cut it so then i call usps i call the company in the US that actually has the card, the organization, I guess they're not a company. But anyways, I talk to one person, a customer service rep, she kind of opens a ticket and says, somebody will get back to me within three days. So I was I found that interesting that the USPS has a three day policy to get back to the customer, whereas Canada Post was 30 days. Anyways, that's a good sign. So two days goes by, actually three days goes by. And right before that three days expires, I get a call from a from a guy at a local post office and he basically explains um i'm sorry can't locate the package you know i've, I've been assigned your claim here but you know it's it was supposed to be in my facility here looked around don't see it um i'm gonna have to mark this claim as closed because i only had these three days to get back to you um and so formally it's done uh but you know in, in the background i'll just keep sniffing around and i'll let you know if i find it and I said, okay, thank you. And that was basically it. And then I called back because I just did, something didn't sit right. And I said, so when you say like it's closed, like what do you mean? He said, well, it's it's lost. And you know the company that you shipped it with, Canada Post, whatever insurance they had on the package, will probably just send you a reimbursement. I'm like, no, no, please don't. Like we don't want to lose this little piece of history. I mean, for one. I think I sold it for $250, something like that, Canadian, so less than $200 US. Um, so $240 Canadian, and then my payout from insurance would be $100. So for one, I didn't want to miss out on that extra $140. Um, but but more importantly than that, like I didn't want this 100-year-old artifact to go missing. And so I said, man, is there anything you can do? Like I tried to... I explained the whole thing about trading cards and our community and everything to somebody who doesn't know what this is all about. And he says, man, I'm going to, I'm going to level with you. He says, I'm going to, I'll ask around, but to be frank, it's probably gone. And I just sat there frustrated. I was very polite as, as I guess us Canadians are, but you know, there's nothing he can do. And I guess nothing I could do. Then 10 minutes later, he calls me back and says, I've got some information. And it wasn't good information. He said, it's been flagged by the U.S. Customs as a prohibited substance. I'm like, 
prohibited substance? It's a piece of cardboard. He says, well, it, it said there was some sort of tobacco product in the package. I'm like, no, I didn't change the description. Churchman's cigarettes was written on the customs forms. That's what flagged it. So he said, it's been marked return to sender. He said, USPS is sending it back to Canada. And he said, fingers crossed, man. Like, And I said, you know, if you had to speculate, if you had to guess, what do you think my chances are of actually getting this card back? And he said, to be frank, probably unlikely. He said, if, if it doesn't get lost by USPS or seized or destroyed or whatever, thrown in a pile of vapes and cigarettes and drugs that are people are trying to ship in the mail. Um, and then, it, you know, it'll maybe make it back to Canada. And then who knows what the Canada customs people are going to do. So I thanked him for his time and I got back to Canada Post and said, hey, I've got new information. I shared about that it was seized, blah, blah, blah. So Canada Post said, uh, you know, when it's marked as return to sender, we need 60 days. It can take up to 60 days, especially coming from the U.S. to get back to the seller or to the shipper. So I had to sit there and wait 60 days and nothing showed up. Uh, It did get scanned back to Canada. So at least I knew it was sitting uh, in Mississauga, which is near Toronto. And then that was on March 22nd, and then it, no scans since then. So here we are, May 2nd, and a month and a half later. So after the 60 days elapsed from the day they told me to, to track, uh, I contacted Canada Post again. And I said, hey, it's been the 60 days. Nothing showed back up. I really want the card. I don't want an insurance payout. You know, can you just give me an update? And I got this generic email saying, uh, sorry, the package was unable to be delivered and we're uh, processing an insurance claim and you'll be receiving a $100 check in the mail. No, I don't want that. So I reply immediately saying, no, I don't want that. I explain the whole story about our community again. Now we don't want to lose this artifact. Uh, it's a important collectible to me, to the, to the buyer, to anybody else who could own this card. And uh, no response. So I call customer service. I reach this lady who's like a robot. No empathy. No, just it was it was honestly the worst customer service experience I've ever had. And so I just felt so deflated. Uh, literally, the check shows up in the mail like a few days later. I've got this hundred dollar check sitting on my desk right now. Uh, after the check showed up, I call customer service again. I said, Hey, here, here's all the ticket numbers I've got. Like, is there, you know, by chance, are you someone who's can help as opposed to the people I've talked to in the past? And he was an awesome guy. This dude's name is Chris. Um, at the end of the day, he wasn't able to help me too much, but he, he, you know, passed it along to the claims department again and put some more thoughtful notes on the file. And, and he also explained to me that basically, the customer service people for the post office, whether it's in the U.S. or Canada, the only thing they can really do is track a parcel or add notes and basically send them to their claims department. And so I needed to talk to the people in the claims department. So I basically barraged them with emails like they had... They had received my previous two emails. They got an email from the robot customer service lady. They got an email from the nice Chris customer service dude. I sent them another follow-up and then I forwarded another correspondence. And basically she responded saying, you know, hey, I'm so sorry that you've lost it. Um, The people in Mississauga are going to start looking. She didn't say it that way. She didn't say they're going to start looking, but she said it hasn't been located um, but we will keep looking. And then I, and I responded to that saying like, thank you so much. I'm happy to hear the you know positive, uh, direction and, and keep, please keep looking. I look forward to an update. And then I asked like, are, are prohibited substances, uh, kept somewhere? Like, is there a pile of packages that are being held for customs or seized for customs or, or God forbid about to be uh, disposed of or anything like that. Like I basically asked that in an email and didn't receive a response, but 
But I think, I think maybe me kind of prodding it more and more in that direction uh, might might have helped to some degree. Uh, because this morning, honestly, I was gearing up to tell this whole story and to just have a bad ending. I was legit up until yesterday, I was going to say, in the podcast, I got to tell a story. I got to, I mean, heck, m- recruit my community to go bother Canada Post to say, let's find this gosh darn Bobby Jones card. I mean, I know it's not the $50,000 Charizard that I heard a guy losing in at the USPS and whatever. Like, I, I know it's not a massive card, but at the end of the day, like, we, we don't want to lose this kind of tobacco card if we, if we can afford to not lose it. So I was prepared, honestly, for a bad story. But this morning... This morning, I got a very brief email from Miriam in the claims department. One sentence. Hello, Mike. Item was located. I will update you when I have more information. And that's it. That That's where I guess we are paused for now. Good news today. They found the Bobby Jones card. I have no idea when it will come back to me. Hopefully they'll ship it back. Hopefully it hasn't been removed from the PSA 2 plastic slab. Hopefully I get this card back. I hope this story wasn't too long-winded and that you you guys are still following along and I can't wait to post results when I actually get the card back. All right, we are back. We are here with Auction Talk. Nick, every week we get to this point and it feels like we're just here. So many topics. We're going to dive in, talk about cards, talk about sports, do what we always do. But first, how are you doing? Okay, I'm just going to jump right to the part where they talk about golf cards. But if you guys do like the sound of that sample you just heard, check out Brett McGrath on Stacking Slabs, especially the auction talk episodes that he does every Thursday with uh, Nick from at the Wharf Sports Cards. All right, here's their bit about Scotty. Let's talk about maybe golf. This is what I got, man. This is what I got. I, <laughs> I watched, I'm not, I'm a cat, I'm the definition of a golf casual. But obviously, like, did some education and tried to understand what was going on before the Masters and, you know, saw the odds, Scotty Scheffler, where he was at. And then just, like, watching him, like, do what he did, you know, with a new baby on the way, just mental strength, get get it done, win his second uh, Masters in three years. I Like, as I'm watching this, I had a comp in my head the whole time. I'm just like, this guy's like Patrick Mahomes, man. Like, Ooh. this is... This is like Mahomes right now. It's like all the expectations, all the weight on his shoulders, and he's just plowing through and winning the most important trophy. And so that was my takeaway from what I saw. I don't think it was like the most exciting Masters ever, but to me, like the su- the golf superstar has arrived, and I think his name is Scotty Scheffler. What, what about you? Yeah, 100%, man. It's interesting that you use that Mahomes comp for a few reasons. Um, Golf is one of those sports where the more you watch it, the more you appreciate, like, the mundane of it, if that makes sense. Um, And most people are casual fans, and I get it. Like, I I understand why. It's like, it's a long sport. Like, you got to, you have to set aside a lot of time to watch, like, a whole tournament. But the mundane of it, so, like, Scheffler was dominating the tournament. So that last day was kind of boring because he like he was just he was dominating everybody, but he was still being, you know, aggressive and not just playing for the lead. He had a couple late birdies there that kind of like took him took him away from from those chasing him. But he is a super just like consistent and and just good at everything golfer. He's not like a I'm gonna hit it four hundred off the tee and then just that that's what puts me ahead of everybody is I'm you know, I'm playing the short game from then on. It's like no, he's He's a great driver, a great mid-range player, great around the green, a really good putter. Like, he's just really good at everything. If you watch him enough for the last few years, you've seen him polish areas of his game, specifically mentally. Like, there's been so many times in the last three years where he's been the leader going into the weekend or going into Sunday, 
and just has these silly mental lapses that that lose him a few strokes and, and he loses by one to three strokes um, on tournaments he should have won. And and he's 27 now. He's kind of maturing into that that mental side of the game and, and closing out tournaments like this where he's the favorite. And but he was the betting favorite, but also like like you said with Mahomes, people are like, there's no way he's gonna win it again. So like I'm gonna bet I'm gonna bet everybody else because there's no chance the odds of somebody else winning are much greater than him winning again. And here he goes and just, you know, dominates the tournament, wins it again, second green jacket in three years. He's only played in five masters and he's won two of them. He's won three tournaments this year. His master stats, like the whole like two and three years and and two and five starts, only like four dudes have done both of those. And both lists have Tiger Woods, Jack Nicholas, and then like two, uh, uh, one other guy on each list that most people wouldn't even remember. And I don't I actually don't even remember their names, but short, super short list for what he did. Uh, but the other reason that is interesting, you brought up Mahomes, Scheffler only has one golf card and it's not even a licensed card. It's an SI for kids. And it's from 2017, coincidentally enough. But I think that's what is really holding golf carts back is like, I didn't get to listen to your last episode yet with uh, about golf cards with Mike. I need to listen to that. So I don't know if you talked about this, but the licensing for golfers for cards is like really, it's crazy. Like the card manufacturers have to negotiate with each individual golfer what they're going to pay them to make their cards, which is why they don't make them because Tigers, I think he still has an exclusive with Upper Deck. I'm not sure that might not be right now. Uh, but he did forever. So it's like the companies were like, well, if we can't even get Tiger, why are we going to go, you know, negotiate against ourselves with every individual golfer and then make a product that, you know, is is way down here on the list of cars that people want. So so there's like, there's just not that much golf product. It just doesn't get made. And Scheffler isn't in any of it, which is kind of crazy. You have the best golfer in the world right now and you can't even buy his cards. So I, I do think that's what holds golf cards back now um in, in older golf cars from going to a new level yeah i love all the points you touched on um if you're looking for more information on golf cards check out that friday episode with mike from bondling cardboard normally there's a lot running through my mind and i kind of want to break down a clip that i share like that but in this case honestly i'm just grateful to hear uh, golf cards getting some love, getting some love on the hobby content alternative that in my mind is becoming mainstream because Brett is doing such a great job with the Stacky Slaps podcast. And their just chatter about Scotty Scheffler was spot on. I mean, this dude is incredible, comparable to Tiger in some respects. And next week, just a quick spoiler, I am going to be sharing another recording from a golf podcast um just from an actual golf analyst not card guys and i will kind of break down the card side of things but uh these guys will really drive home and put in perspective what scotty scheffler is doing because it is bonkers all right it's time for card of the week Actually, I think I forgot to even talk about the card of the week last week, so let's just quickly hit it. That was the 2019 Sports Illustrated for Kids, John Rom, PSA 7. Uh, this was the card donated to the Fondling Cardboard Masters Pool as a draw prize. It was donated by Paul Hickey, who uh, you guys are familiar with from the last couple episodes. Um, and yeah, Paul and No Off Season dot com, where Paul has a premium membership to help you guys make money. Um, flipping cards and the sports card strategy show podcast uh, they donated this card and i was grateful and i'm sure the person that won this card is grateful so thanks again guys as for card of the week this week we've got a cool one this is the 2021 upper deck artifacts greg norman auto facts in a psa 10 and that is a greg norman the shark autograph card it's actually a super cool looking card it's got this very elegant design it's got some gold kind of embroidery um it's got a, a very uh, uh let's say basic headshot of greg norman however you know he's smiling he doesn't look so evil like he does in all the instagram posts that you know people share these days because of his his influence over live and and those controversial uh saudis and all that but you know 
I, I honestly think this is a super cool card. Um, I bought this for a pretty good price. I, I honestly, I know I wasn't planning on buying a Greg Norman card, but it was on auction from a Canadian seller. And I always think I can get good deals from a Canadian seller, uh, especially on auction. So I threw in a bit of like $60 Canadian. I wanted at like, I think $56 Canadian. And I thought, ah, you know, I came back. I didn't have buyer's remorse, but I just thought, you know, if I could flip this for double what I paid for it, so be it. And someone will be happy and I'll get some extra cash. Um, so much for me just being a beer collector and, and not talking about flipping. But anyways, I was also happy to keep the card because it's, it's a really sweet card and I love artifacts. Um, if it was on card, honestly, this would have 100% been a keeper. But, you know, once you get it and you look at the sticker autograph and you're kind of like, ah, I have so many cards. I've got lots of nice cards. Do I really need this sticker auto in my collection? Anyways, so I, I posted on eBay for $120 Canadian thinking, you know, if something comes in around $100 as an offer, I will accept it. Um, and it was just sitting there, honestly, on eBay for a long time, like two months, maybe even longer, two, three months, maybe. And two weeks ago, uh, somebody sends me an offer, uh, or no, they didn't send me an offer. It was just watchers. And I clicked, uh, you know, send an offer to the watchers. And so I sent them an offer of a hundred dollars and the dude accepted it. So I thought, Oh, awesome. Cool. Looks like I made a sale and I wanted some cash too. I had a PSA return coming in, uh, pretty, pretty soon. And, uh, I, I, you know, thought a hundred, a hundred dollars Canadian, that, that'll be, you know, that'll pay for some of these cards that just got graded. Uh, so the guy pays and I, I'm, I'm like about to print the eBay shipping label. And then I realized, wait a second. And, and something clicked and I pulled up my PSA submission and I had sent the card in for grading and I forgot to remove it from my eBay listings. So, oh, I felt so bad. I send the, the guy message and I said, Hey, I explained the situation. I'm sorry about this. And uh, he was he was kind of annoyed. Um, to be fair, like, fine. Like, I deserve negative feedback for this. And then, yeah, he left negative feedback. So that was my first ever negative feedback on eBay, which for those of you who don't, don't know, that's a big deal. Like, you don't want that big red X on your feedback page. You never want even a single negative feedback. So... Um, co coincidentally, like the next day, my PSA grades popped and, you know, I had a great, uh, FaceTime call with my friend. I shared my screen on my phone and flipped through all the grades. And he and I had a blast just checking out all the PSA tens that I got. And, uh, and the Greg Norman turned out to get a PSA 10. And so, you know, before I went to sleep that night, I thought, you know what, man, I just, I feel so guilty. I want to at least offer the card to the guy. And so I thought, what do I do? My original plan was to list the card for $500 Canadian and then accept any offers that came in at $300. Uh, because obviously PSA 10, like it's a pop one. It's, it's a very, it's a beautiful card. Like it, it honestly, for a Greg Norman fan, this would be a, a, a great card. Like maybe not a centerpiece of a collection, uh, a centerpiece of a lot of collections, I guess. But you know, for like a hardcore collector still like a, a nice card. So what I, and I thought, well, you know, do I take the hundred dollars and then whatever the grading fee and shipping and whatever, do I just ask him to kind of cover all that and then give it to him at like a crazy discounted price? And so I reached out to the guy and just said, Hey, the grades popped. Um, I should have the card within a few days. Like, do you want it graded as a PSA 10? And, uh, the guy said, yeah, yeah, I'm still interested. So I said, I explained, I was going to list it for 500 accept anything above 300. We hashed it out a little bit and said, you know what? Let's meet in the middle. Uh, $200 Canadian. Uh, I'm, I feel like that's a great price for the card. He was really happy about it. And you know, the only caveat was you got to change that negative feedback to positive. You know, he gets the card he wanted in a, in a perfect grade. And you know, I, funny enough, I made a little bit more money than I expected and got rid of the negative feedback. So at the end of the day, it all worked out. So that's your card of the week with a bonus little story about it. Finally, we're going to squeeze in mailbag. 
And we actually have three questions in the mailbag, and they are all from friend of the show, Adam Van Z. So we'll start off with his question about a Panini release for Liv. He says, do you think the Panini release for Liv will be expensive boxes? In other sports, they are pricey, and I wonder if that will push buyers away for golf. And my initial response to Adam was, oh boy. So Adam, you are definitely in... Uh, for a bit of a rude awakening, and I don't mean that in any offense, and honestly, I'm saying that just about golf card collectors in general. For people who collect basketball, football, any other sports where Panini Prism has been released, you guys, those people, would know. They they would anticipate. The prices are going to be crazy. Like the it, Honestly, it doesn't make sense, but it is what it is. So I'm not telling you, you know, if you guys have deep pockets, I'm not telling you to go out and buy it just because they do in other sports. Do what I do. Let other people open the product. Let uh, breakers break the product and let people waste their money gambling, trying to hit one of ones and the black prisms and the nebula one of ones and whatever. Like that, that honestly, that stuff's going to be crazy expensive. Um, but there's going to be some amazing cards that are not the, you know, absolute chase cards of the product that you know if you buy if you bought a couple boxes to rip yourself you'd be lucky to hit one and it wouldn't even pay the price of the the box or two so buy your singles um yes it's going to be expensive i really can't see a world where it's going to be cheap um maybe the price would come down you know after it's released it'll be expensive for a couple of months uh, single prices will simmer down, let's say six months after release. So if you were to look like a year after release, uh, maybe like as the next year of prism golf is coming out, it makes me wonder if the product might come down, uh, if, if interest and everything just kind of wanes. Um, however, it's the first year of prism and first year of prism has shown in basically every other sport compared to subsequent years of prism that they are extremely valuable so 2012 for i think basketball uh maybe something similar for football 2013 or something those years those cards are almost like the players rookie cards even for vets who've been around for years like tom brady for instance you know or um you know, I'll use LeBron, actually. LeBron's rookie season was like 2003 or four, 2004, I think, for his actual uh, playing and for his rookie cards through tops and upper deck. But the Panini Prism product, where he got his first Prism card in 2012, even that base card is valuable. The, the silver Prism is ridiculously priced. The gold Prisms were probably five figures or more. Heck. I have no idea, but it's astronomical and it's not even his rookie card. So I anticipate for the big guys on live, you know, or, or like even legacy names like Phil Mickelson uh, or, or Brooks Kepka, who doesn't have cards anywhere else. John Rom, similar boat. These guys are going to have crazy expensive cards and that is going to drive the price of the entire sealed product. So hope that was uh, brief enough for you, Adam. Let's get to your next question, which was, uh, how rare are the employee exclusive Tiger Woods cards? They aren't numbered, but clearly are a limited release. And my gut instinct was between, uh, between 50 to 125. For some reason, the number 125 stuck out of my head, but I thought, you know, maybe there's a chance it's shorter printed than that. Um, so I reached out to somebody from Upper Deck. Uh, he got back to me and said it's in the range of 100 to 250 based on just employee exclusive releases that come out every year. Um, obviously, it's not always Tiger Woods. There's employee exclusives for all kinds of Upper Deck cards that they get. It's almost like a bonus for them. Uh, they is basically is actually considered part of their compensation package. And a lot of the employees end up just turning around and selling it because they need the money. Um, however, there are obviously massive collectors within upper deck who hold on to the cards or buy them from their coworkers. So anyways, that is the history about hundred to 150. You have a beautiful version. You've got a PSA eight of this patch auto tiger card. I love your version of it, Adam, because it's the card itself has this red, beautiful, bloody background. It's not bloody, but like that's, 
you know, Tiger Woods wears blood red on Sunday. So that's kind of the association I have with it. Tiger Woods is wearing his Sunday red in the card. Uh, and the big patch with the little patch window uh, has, has a big, um, you know, it's, it's a napkin one. So it's, it's not a white napkin, but it's just a plain color. But at least the color is red. So awesome card, Adam. And then last but not least, you asked uh, about these Dazzler cards. So 2024 Upper Deck Golf Dazzlers. I'm aware of Dazzlers in blue, orange, pink, and green. I have one that's neither orange nor green, but more reddish. Are there more colors that I'm aware of? I think the golf cards and memorabilia Facebook group answered your question um, because, uh, let's see, Mark Miller posted some pictures. Dean Fortino said the red parallels are exclusive to retail blaster boxes, one in 24 packs. Uh, James Peacock also chimed in, five colors total. Red isn't very red. It could have done a better job making it stand out. So thanks, Mark and Jane, for chiming in there. Thanks, Adam, for being a three-peat mailbag question asker. And hopefully more of you guys have mailbag questions. If you hit me up on my DMs on Instagram or just comment on a Facebook post tagging me, whatever, just saying, hey, question for the mailbag. All right, guys, I know this was a bit of a goulash episode, and I don't know if there's necessarily a single theme that kind of weaved everything together, but... Um, I am feeling inspired by something, so I'm going to close out with that. And it's a YouTube channel that I've been checking out lately. It's a guy called Ali Abdal, and he just is passionate about teaching people through YouTube videos about all kinds of things. Uh, he's a, a, a was a doctor, uh, started YouTubing as a medical student, and it just kind of blew up and decided, you know what, I'm just going to do this YouTube stuff full time. And you know, he he was talking to an entrepreneur about you know uh taking it seriously but also enjoying the process and you know all the the lots of tips and stuff about being successful and honestly i don't remember the name of the episode but i recommend you guys all check out his his channel um but if you're listening to this you know i i i just felt inspired listening to this entrepreneurial content because it really reminded me of what Brett McGrath from Stacking Slabs calls, you know, you can be the CEO of your own collection. You can treat this like a business, even though it's just a hobby. Uh, and when I say treat it like a business, I don't mean making money. I mean, you can be the CEO in the direction, in the, in the strategy, in the, in the planning of your collection. Make it what you want. You don't just have to let your collection go whatever way the wind blows it. So anyways, the recipe that uh, this entrepreneurial expert was sharing that honestly I feel like it's this formula that could really uh, make you happy with your collecting is this you set a goal what do you want to collect plan it out then you look at how you currently collect what am I doing and pinpoint what the disconnect is between what you want and what you're doing and at the end of the day, if what you want is whatever, a 52 mantle and a high grade, maybe that's not attainable. So you have to change something. Are you going to change your goal and set your priorities to something more realistic? Or are you going to set change what you're doing? Go become a baller, you know, entrepreneur, <laughs> uh, employee, doctor, whatever, make a bunch of money, and then you can buy that card. But you have to do something to pinpoint what the disconnect is and do something about it. Take action to align the goal with your actions. But most importantly, enjoy the journey because collecting isn't about the conclusion. So many people that I've listened to said, when I got the card, I just kind of stared at it and thought, hmm, you know, maybe it didn't give me the warm fuzzies. And I've experienced this with some cards. Uh, not all, you know, there's some cards that I get that gave me way more warm fuzzies than I ever expected. Um, or when you complete a set, you know, it's like uh, the, taking it to the worst end of the spectrum. Somebody uh, spent years trying to complete this set. They finished it and then sold it, the entire set off immediately. I saw this happen on the golf cards uh, memorabilia or the golf memorabilia collectors Facebook group. Not not my golf cards and memorabilia group, but a different golf memorabilia group. And this guy had a Sunday ticket from every single one of tiger's major wins so 
15 tickets, entry stubs, whatever they were, uh, graded, authenticated, and he was selling them. As soon as he finished it off, boom, time to sell. And, you know, that that's not what I want. You know, I I want to I want to enjoy the journey so that in case that happens, it wasn't all for nothing. If I complete my project and I'm happy and I want to display it, I want to keep it, all the better. But if you if you don't enjoy the journey and the process, you're setting yourself up for failure. And I'll finish off with this. Ali Abdal actually had a quote uh, that really resonated with me. And it was like, it's like playing a video game. The goal is not to complete the game. The goal is to have fun along the way. The goal of a musical symphony is not the climax. The goal is to enjoy the symphony. Thank you so much again for tuning in as you do every week. Whatever podcast player you're listening on, just give the show a follow. It really helps me understand what's happening with the audience. And don't forget to join the Golf Cards and Memorabilia Facebook group. Follow me on Instagram at the Golf Card Collector and at Fondling Cardboard. So I'll see you then. golf card collector.